stand all over the house this evening. Let's join together in worship.
remain standing for prayer. Lord, we just love you today. We glorify your name. Lord, we welcome you in this place today. Father, we pray that every note that is played, song that is sung, scripture read, message given, would be for the advancement and the building of the kingdom of God. Lord, we thank you for every man, woman, boy, or girl represented in this place tonight. And we will be forever grateful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor that is due your name. In Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen. Will you take the next few moments this evening and greet those around you in the Lord at this time? all over the house again this evening, going back into worship before Bible study.
And you may be seated tonight in the presence of the Lord if you can. This time we're going to ask um, those that are going to come. We're going to have a special song uh, before uh, Sister Melody come and teaches Bible study at this time. So we're going to ask those to come at this time and uh, sing for us, and then we'll jump right into Bible. house of the Lord tonight. Glad to know I know him as my Lord and my Savior. Love him with all my heart tonight. Praise him and thank him for his goodness to me. Y'all pray for me as I sing an old, old song. I'll talk to my father for you. And you know that's the best thing in the world that any of us can do is talk to our father for each other. Y'all pray for me. If you sure like to share there's one special way I can show Oh 
ago. So let me fill myself with your word. Then let me speak only your word. No more, no less. Lord, for whatever reason, this has been a little bit of a challenge for me this week. Pray you'd help my mind be clear, my ability to articulate your word, to be on point. God, when we leave your house today, we can say, surely it has been good to be in the house of the Lord this day. Lord, I pray that you would bless us now with an open mind, an open ears, and an open heart to receive what you have spread on the table today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Miss Hannah, let's start with um, the grid of, yeah, now, I, mm, and there's no way to blow that up, is it? Right there, that, well, trust me on this, Coach, then. I was um, hoping that would come out a little bit better than that, but it is what it is. So, I want to start by talking to you, or uh, naming for you, the five basic offerings and sacrifices, and then we'll go into what's what. So if you're a note taker, you're gonna have to, I'm going to have to talk fast and you're going to have to write fast because we have a lot of ground to cover tonight in order to get it all in. So it might be a little bit different, um, but we'll see where it goes. So first of all, I want to say to you that um, there are five offerings, and they are listed on the slide that you cannot see. Um, but the first one is the burnt offering. And we'll talk about that one in just a moment. The meal offering or the grain offering is the second one. The third one is the peace offering. The fourth is the sin offering. And the fifth is the trespass or the guilt offering. And I want to start by just having a moment of conversation about why would God even do stuff like that? I mean, you know, we get all into this. I mean, if you read the first seven chapters of Leviticus, which is where all the offerings are, chapter 1 through chapter 7, I mean, it's like death in the details. You know, you've got to do it this way, and, and Brother Larry, you couldn't veer off of that. I mean, you had to do it a certain way, and I mean, it was a lot of work. It was not an easy task. So I got to thinking about this week, and I thought, well, Lord, you know, why such detail? So I'm not going to tell you that what I'm getting ready to tell you is, is came out of my mind, it came out of many commentaries and, um, you know, life application study Bible and just, you know, all kind of places, but Brother Jimmy, after kind of putting those things together, this is what I came up with. I do believe the intent behind God instituting the way these sacrifices were laid up for the three following purposes, so if you're a note taker, this, maybe this will make sense to you. I believe that God instituted these so that the children of Israel would have very specific steps. You know me, principles. Not just the step. What, what's behind the step? Why did he do it, right? Very specific principles to cleanse them from heathen and worldly practices. And why would I even say that? Where did they just come from? Where, where, when, when all this is going on, where, where did they just come out of? Egypt. How long have they been in Egypt? you got to remember, these people didn't know church yet. Right? Their children didn't grow up in church. So if for God to move them in the direction of where they were going, he had to institute principles, steps, um, basic, we would call it basic doctrine, for them to understand to get Egypt out of them and because that's all they'd ever known was Egypt. So he was asking them to get Egypt out and get God in, okay? Number two, these were steps to, re to restore pure worship. Now remember, it wasn't that the children of Israel didn't know how to worship in Egypt because the, I mean, they did have from the forefathers and all that kind of stuff, Brother Mary. But remember, in Egypt, there was a lot of other worship going on that had nothing to do with God, right? All the idols and all the worship that went along there. So he had to teach them by principles pure worship, like worship to God, not by God, just, but the true and living God. In order for them to lessen their chance to go back, and that's important, that's, that's a driving home moment there, because if God had not given them specific principles to follow, if it had been kind of generic, 
it would have been easy to fall back into what they did. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning, didn't we, Brother Man? It would be easy where I came from if I do not have specific um, doctrine, discipline, whatever you want to say, it would be easy for me to go back to where I came from because why? That's what I knew. So it's, it's learning a new way, if you will, and they needed specific steps to get them there. Um, I use this line. This, God's principles here were not about how close can I stay, but what? How far away can I get? But man, you mentioned that this morning. I can drink the Mountain Dew. It's not that I can't. But if I stay close to the other activities that are going on and I'm not strong enough, what's going to happen? It's easier for me to fall back in my old ways. You know, and I'm not saying we don't need to impact the world. Don't miss what I'm saying. But my strength will speak to, my spiritual strength will speak to whether I can do that or not. And so it's better for me to stay farther away than it is closer to. The third thing is God instituted these principles of um, offerings and sacrifice to um, give a graphic picture of the seriousness of sin. I don't know that we do a very good job in the church world of that. I, I mean, I don't mean that in a harsh way. I'm just saying if we really believe sin had as serious consequences as it had, we might be a little more fervent, right? If you don't want your kid in it, how, how far are you going to stand on the roof over it? Yes? Somebody who's been there and done that and doesn't want their kid to go there is a bit more vocal than maybe somebody who's not. True? Absolutely. So what this chart will tell, what, this, what we will talk about here tonight is there's each of these offerings have a purpose, they have a significance, and they will reflect something about Christ because all of this is about a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ would do in order to bring us back into fellowship with God. That's the whole point. Man was in fellowship with God. Fall, fall came, right? Adam and Eve, fall came. And now there has to be a way for us to get back to God. Jesus isn't going to come for many thousands of years. So these principles are based on a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ would do for us. Um, the next slide should be, talk about there's two types of offerings. And we'll break those down tonight. Number one, they're offerings of reparation. It's repair damage to repair damaged relationship with God. Those two offerings will be the sin offering and the trespass or guilt offering. But those are all about repairing a damaged relationship with God. Then there will be um, offerings or sacrifices of consecration. There are three of those. Those will advance the life of the believer. Those are about drawing closer to God, if you will. Those will be the burnt offering, the peace offering, and the meal offering, or the grain offering. And we're going to talk about all those here in just a minute. We won't do them in this order, though that's the way they are. Leviticus, the ninth chapter, will tell you what order the sacrifices were done in, and you couldn't get those out of order. The reason I bring that up is because the repair of, of the damage between men and God had to happen first. You can't have sacrifices of consecration and, oh, I love you, Jesus, right, until when? You've made right relationship with you and God, or me and God, right? So... Um, as we go through these tonight, we're going to go through them as they were presented in Leviticus. Leviticus 1, Leviticus 2, Leviticus 3. But when you get in Leviticus 9, it will tell you the order they did them in. And that was specific. You can't get one order out of another. People try to do that all the time. Oh, I love you, Jesus, but I don't have a relationship with Jesus. Eh, that won't work. Okay. The first one, um, the next slide should tell... Uh, and all, turn it over. What do you want me to do? Turn it this way. What do you want me to do now? Hello. Okay. When you're unclip it and move it, it won't do that. You want me to do it this way? It won't work. You're really killing me here, brother. You're cutting into my time. 
Well, help me, that's what I birthed you for. <laughs> or maybe not. I'm just saying. I hope the older I get, he won't have to do all that. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to be I'm going to be like my uncle Henry when I'm 81 or 80 or whatever he's getting ready to be so that I take care of myself. Just saying up front, giving you a heads up. I got 20 more good years coming. All right. So the next one will be the burnt offering um, and it has to do with it's found in Leviticus the first chapter. It will also be found in Leviticus 6, 9 and 13, but we're coming out of Leviticus 1 for this one. And the burnt offering was an offering that was made for the nation twice a day, morning and evening, okay? But individuals would make, would make this as well. So this was corporate as well as individual. But this is about life, life consecration. Now, when we talk about this altar of burnt, uh, this uh, brazen altar and the altar of um, the burnt offering or the sacrifice, this was a little bit, misleading because most scholars, now everybody doesn't say this, but most scholars believe it had dirt around it. And, and I will talk about why in just a few minutes because where the Bible talked about how the priest would walk up to the edge of it. But they, a priest was not allowed to walk up steps. He had to walk up an earthen uh, ramp, if you will. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. Life consecration is the central message of the burnt offering. It's found in Leviticus 1, 2, and 3. Speak to the children of Israel, say to them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the, of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. That's important. He shall offer it, this is important, of his own voluntary will. That's important. At the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. This sacrifice is about my daily walk with God. The burnt offering was to be an offering without blemish. Why? Why, why is God so picky? I mean, I don't mean to be ugly, but now I got a whole flock. I got a herd out here. Not flock, but in this case, a herd. A whole herd out here. And Brother Rocky, now think about this. They're doing this twice a day. Now, I know you got a million people out there. I don't know how much, you know, cattle you got, but you got to go. But they couldn't have even one speck. Who's going to go through all that and figure that out? Who's got, whose job was to go out and say, don't use that one. He's got a, you know, messed up foot or whatever. Think about how much time and effort and how expensive that becomes. Why is God so picky? All right, so Tina says, God gave his best. We're to give our best. It's to speak. Remember when we, when we talked about the reason God did all this, he had specific steps because they needed to understand, number one, the high cost of sin and the sincere commitment it was going to take. It could not be flippant attitude. It had to teach them reverence for a holy God. My, my eh is not good enough. And that it was total submission. God gave his best. If I'm totally submitted to God, I got to give my best. That's, he, they drive that home every day, twice a day. Everybody had to, had to see that happen over and over and over again. I... It's the principle of I cannot come to God any old way. I've got to come with a whole, my whole spirit, my whole attitude, my soul, my mind, my heart, my, everything about me. My outside had to present to God in a, in a certain way. My inside has to present to God in a certain way. See what I'm saying? God says you can't, the whole being had to be right, not just one of them, not part of that. The offering of consecration is meaningful only when, and if you look up at the, at the screen there, it, nope, you had it, don't leave me. Right there where it says the sin offering and the guilt offering, those had to happen first because, again, you can't come to a holy God until what? Until you've dealt with the sin piece, okay? 
Self-consecration must be freely given. I give the gift of myself, not because I have to, but because I want to. Even though the burnt offering is voluntary, worship cannot take place until it is given. This offering is not demanded by God. It's something I bring. It, it's a teen, I'll use your line. In my, um, in my receiving of Jesus covering my sins, I'm offering myself back to him. You see what I'm saying? I'm thanking him because of what he's done for me, and I'm willing to give him most of my life. Well, I mean, you know, almost. I mean, there's a couple little things I would, you know, I mean, he's probably not real happy with that, but, I mean, I, uh, for the most part, I got this covered. He said he's a jealous God and he wouldn't take it. Well, that's just not good. Maybe he's not worth serving. Really. Maybe for you he's not. Maybe for me he's not. But the truth is, I can tell you at this journey, point my journey, oh, he's well worth every step of the trip. All right, Galatians 2 and 20, I believe, is Miss Sandy. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am what? I am crucified. What a strong word. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That goes back to that burnt offering thing that says my daily walk. You see what I'm saying? Every day. I am, it's not a one-time event. Being crucified with Christ is not a one-time event. I came down here. I gave, my, I gave my heart to God. You know, Maybe you didn't do that down here. Maybe you were at the kitchen sink. I mean, it doesn't matter where, right? But it's not about... A one time, it, I have to crucify myself how much? Well, why would I need to do that? Because every day, the, Egypt comes creeping up. And that's what he was trying to teach them. It's in response to what he's done for me. The burnt offering is a commitment I make to allow him to finish his work on this earth through me. To touch through me. To speak through me. To care through me. To love through... How do people see Jesus? You know, every now... I'm, I'm going to say me now. I'm not saying this is true of y'all. But you know, sometimes when you lay down at night and you think back through the day and you go, Ooh, I wonder what they saw today. At work, at home. Anybody ever, ever had to go back and apologize? We ride along yesterday, no, day before yesterday, Friday, and apparently my dear husband did not like the way I was driving. And first of all, I didn't ask to drive. That was his doings, you know. He said drive. I didn't, I'm like, okay, whatever. And so apparently by my response to him and then in turn his response to me he felt like I was quipping a little bit I don't know if you know what that means but I thought about some other family members that I know who have this happen in their vehicles sometimes but um, anyway I, uh, so Sister Carol before the day was over now you talk about just get my goat I'm like no nah, it wasn't that big a deal God really I mean, come on now. I mean, he asked for it. You know what I'm saying? Right? I mean, I'm not being ugly, but I, there were two car leaks. Two. Like big cars, not baby cars. Big cars. Are you going to stop? I was like, well, yeah, thought about it. Egypt can creep up. Any time during the day. And I had to apologize. Now, I don't know if he thought it was, it was, you know, sincere or not. It was. I don't know if he thought it was, but I tried to make it sincere. I mean, I didn't say, listen, if you don't like the way I drive, just drive yourself. I didn't say that. I, I just said, I just said, you know, 
I, I'm sorry if that came across. I, really, I was not trying to be ugly, but, you know, if my driving makes you nervous, then maybe you should drive. I mean, I didn't. I did not say it was an attitude. And I knew I had to teach come Sunday. I was like, Lord, I don't want you to come up and get me because I didn't. Anyway, all right. So go to the slide where they got two men and a goat. Yeah, so this is, this is the process happening here. Because if you'll notice, one guy's got his hand on the head. The other one's got him by the throat. And he's holding on to him so he won't get away. Listen to this. Leviticus 1, 4, and 5. And he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord and the priest. Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood around about the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. The priest couldn't do it. The Bible, God wanted these people to understand that there is a high price to sin. When they put their hands on the head of that animal, it was a symbol. It didn't really do anything, but it's kind of like when we pray for people, you know, use all, but it was a symbol of transference of guilt. I'm, you know, I acknowledge this guilt. That that innocent being is going to take my guilt and have to be sacrificed for me. I mean, he had to look in the eyes of that critter. And he had the offender. And then he had to take care of business. And, that, and he had to listen to all of that that went around that and see that and know that because of him, that had to happen. Oh, that we grabbed the concept of that. Oh, that we grabbed the concept of that. But the priest couldn't do it. The offender had to do it. The wages of sin is... But the gift of God... All right, I can take it as far as I can, but then there's a mediator that has to take it from there. If you'll notice when we were reading that scripture, the offender had to, take, had to do the business, if you will, of taking care of the sacrifice, but the blood was sprinkled by whom? By the priest. That's the middleman. That's the mediator. Thank God he sent Jesus to be my mediator because his blood was sprinkled for my sin. That makes sense? They didn't understand that, Brother Marion, because that wasn't going to happen for thousands of years, but that's the picture here. That's what it's all about. It talk, it, this is speaking to the atonement. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Okay. Only I can stop living for self and live my life in total dedication to God. You can't make me do it. You can't guilt me into it. What do, I, what do I mean by you can't guilt me into it? What does that mean? You can't guilt me into it. You know, if we're not careful, we try to guilt people into getting saved. How long is that going to last? You ever heard the old adage, um, there's no atheist in a foxhole? I mean, you're a military man, right? But when I get out of the foxhole, what happens? I forget about what I said. We can't guilt people into loving Jesus. Now, we can show people how to love Jesus. We can help people see why they might want to love Jesus. But I can't guilt them into loving Jesus. Because only I can speak to my life and what I'm doing in my walk of faith with Jesus. Now, I can pray for them. Don't miss that because I can. But, all right, Leviticus 6, 9 through 13. I want to take you there a minute. This one's kind of interesting to me. Command Aaron and his sons saying, this is the law of the burnt offering. Again, that offering, the burnt offering will be the offering that is made it is making payment, if you will, for sin, sin in general. It's showing my devotion to God because, because God, God's taken you know, thought of me. This is me in return taking thought of God. All right, it, it represents Jesus voluntarily laying down his life for my sin and my response to that. 
what the burnt offering is all about. Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt, it is the burnt offering because the burning of the altar, the burning upon the altar all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. And the priest shall put, now watch this, and the priest shall put his linen garment on and his linen breeches. Anybody know what a linen breeches is? It's linen pants. Yeah. He shall put upon his flesh, he shall shake the ashes that the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. Then he shall put off his garments, put on other garments, and carry the ashes outside the camp unto a clean place. And the fire on the altar shall be burning in it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering on it in order, um, in order upon it. And he shall burn thereof the fat of the peace offering. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. And remember, I said the burnt offering was all about, my, about general sin, right? We offered that general sin. It's acknowledging that God has taken me. I'm giving him back all of me. Okay, God's done something for me. I'm giving him all of me. And it's important because I didn't give this to anybody, but I bet you can quote it. Romans 12 and 1. Anybody know what that is? I beseech ye now, brethren. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Romans 12 1. I beseech ye now, brethren, by the mercies of God, what? That you present your bodies a what? You can't do a living sacrifice. Sacrifice something dead. What's a living sacrifice? Daily. I daily die to, to the Egypt in me. Right? And then, Brother Jimmy, I might have been wrong, but I thought you said something about something reasonable. What's that reasonable mess? Watch what he said. Body's a living sacrifice every day. I got to do this. And then he's really all about that holy stuff. Remember we said God said you've got to be, it's about teaching them reverence. Well, we do a good job of that these days, don't we? Reverence to God, holy and acceptable to God. Wait a minute, it can't be just anything. God's got to accept it. So it's got to be on God's terms, not my terms. You with me? I can't offer God this any old thing. And Brother Jimmy, to your point, which is my reasonable service yep now that being said it is it is interesting that in that same passage of scripture there's a couple of words that I don't want you to miss number one he said the burning has to happen on the altar all night who wants to be the night shift I mean brother Marion I know you work nights because you got to to make a living but I mean who's dying to work night shift Somebody's got to do it. Well, let's all stand in line and volunteer that we're going to be the keepers of the altar at night. What does it mean to be the keeper of the altar at night? Okay, how do you keep the fire going all night? You know, may God help us be willing to be the night shift. Somebody had to keep it going all night. Am I willing to get up at 3 or 2 or 4? Just don't even go to bed. Do you see what I'm saying? He said the fire's got to go all night. And then he said, and it can't ever go out. What happens if we aren't careful? We let the fire go out. And if the fire goes out, God's not going to be pleased. He said, he said do you know... That they couldn't, he said, well, what do they do when they move from place to place? Anybody know what happened when they went from place to place? They took the fire with them. It was somebody's job when they moved from, you know, spot A to spot B. They had to put live hot coals in the fire pans, and they had to travel with that, not let it go out. That means why are they walking, why are they traveling with that thing? They had to make sure that the fire didn't go out. Because they had to use that fire to start the next one when they set camp. I'm not a preacher, but I bet you some of you guys in here could just tear up a sermon on that one. 
keeping the fire going. That's what he said. That's not what I said. That's the, that's the principle in here. No acknowledgement of what God's done, there will be no appreciation. My living sacrifice is my response to acknowledgement of a price paid for my sin. If I, don't think my, if I don't think too much of my sin, I don't think too much of what the payment is. I mean, if I don't think I've done, you know, it's no big deal. Then I'm not going to be jacked up about it. And I won't realize how much God has really done for me. You know, it's really sobering if you spend a little time with God over in the corner by yourself and ask God to really kind of pull the curtain back to remind us, what is that, show me where you brought me from and where I could have been. Remember, I'm human. Humans forget. What's the song? Wasn't it Dottie Rambo? But remind me. Well, he can't remind me if I'm not even listening. Right? Right? The fire of total consecration shall be ever burning. The live coals in that fire pan, each priest had a personal responsibility to keep the fire alive. How about me? It's the responsibility of every believer to gather live coals from the altar of God during the, not just on Sunday. I may, I may get them on Sunday and carry them in the week, but the truth of the matter is I need to have them during the week and bring them in on Sunday. Right? It's not his responsibility alone. No, it is his responsibility, but not his alone. Right? Lively stones. Okay. Let's go to the meat or the meal offering. It's known in some uh, translations, if you will, of the grain offering. That's in Leviticus, the second chapter. So, burnt offering made payment for sin in general. It showed my devotion to God. It spoke of voluntarily laying, Jesus voluntarily laying, laying down his life for me. It was the perfect sacrifice. Now we go to the meal or the grain offering. This offering will show honor and respect, honor and respect to God in worship. It's an acknowledgement that all we have, all I have came from God. God gave it to me. The very breath that I breathe. The effort that I make to work. What, what everything I got came from God. Everything. I did not do it on my own. He gave it to me. Well, no, I earned it. <laughs> okay, well, I tell you what. Let him snatch breath for about 20 minutes and let's see how far we get. Right? I had somebody say, well, God didn't do that. I did that. I said, okay, can you hold your breath for a minute? And they said, what does that got to do anything? I said, just hold your breath. I, I don't even know how. I said, as long as you can. As long as you can. And, and they, you know, well, how long can you hold it? I don't, know, I don't know what the world record is, but you get my point. After a while, what happens? <gasps> right? Wait a minute, wait a minute, don't do that. That's God's air. Don't, don't do that. You said you got this. Don't bother his air. And they're like, what do you think, what do you think somebody's response at that point is going to be? You know, they give you the evil eye. Because that's the way it works. It's acknowledging all that I have belongs to God. And God, Sistina, God gave his all. I, in return, I need to give my all. Leviticus 2 and 1. And we offer a meat or a meal offering unto the Lord. This offering shall be a fine flour. Pour oil on it and put frankincense thereof. Again, my response. So what is that? What is this about? The flower, if you will, represents my labor. You know, they, like they, where they would farm. And, but I might have planted, but God gave the increase. Does that make sense? Okay. The flower representing the results of my labor. It's an evidence of my giftedness, what God's given me. The ability to work, the ability to teach, the ability to whatever it is your, your gifting might be. It is, a, it is a meal offering. It is one of service. I give back to God out of what I have and, and what he's given me, right? If, and, and I thought it was interesting. I mean, I don't know. This is my opinion. But it didn't just say flour. It said fine flour. That was the best flour. 
And that goes back to giving God my best. And then he said, pour oil on it. Okay, everybody in here, Pentecostal knows this. What, what, what is oil representative of? Spirit of God, right? <clears throat> when I give God my abilities, my talents. I don't think I gave anybody this, and please help me if I misquote it. This is Colossians 3 and 23. But it, the Bible in Colossians 3 and 23 says, whenever I do something, I should do it how? Heartily as unto the Lord and not to men. I don't work for MUSD. Yeah, yeah you do. They, they cut your paycheck. Drops in the drops in the in the bank every two weeks. Where Mike, I don't. I, and the Lord has to remind me of that sometime now. I don't work for MUSC. I work for God. Somebody somebody asked me one time, why are you why are you so meticulous about writing down how much your time is? I mean, you know, if it's fifteen minutes, what is fifteen minutes? I said, because I promise you, when I put my time in. I'm going to work over my allotted because maybe I was, you know, took 30 extra minutes somewhere along. But I try my best to give them 100% plus because I want God and myself to, when I go to bed at night to know I gave God my very best. They can't tell me I shorted him because I've I done my best not to. Well, I did. I mean, you know, I think uh, don't take it from them. When it was time to leave, when it was time to leave Orangeburg, and uh, you know, you pack up your office and your desk and all that, I really had to think hard about what needed to go with me. Now, my personal stuff, you know, I had it in the box, right? But I had to look real hard, Sister Jennifer, about okay, now what needs to go with me? Because if this is going to be used for work, yes, but I don't need that getting caught up in my personal stuff. You say, oh, you're getting kind of nitpicky now, aren't you? Girl, I'm telling you, I put them those sticky notes back. I go to the dollar store and buy my own. I don't want God looking at me and said, you stole that. That wasn't yours. Are you kidding me? Are you smoking weed? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I am. But I don't want God to look at me and go, you stole that. that was a, what is the definition of being a thief? Taking something that what? It didn't belong to me. I didn't buy it. Right? And I put the M-U-S-C tag on some of that stuff. Like, if I die, you send it back over there so I don't get blitzed on the way up. Right? Just saying. Got to be careful. All right. Meal offering. My giftedness, my efforts, my, my labor, if you will, to God. And notice it was also the fine flour, my labor, the oil. It's God's gifts to me. It, they are not my gifts. Anything God can do, my little penny ante way of teaching has nothing to do with me. It's God's Spirit gave me a gift. That's not my gift. That's God's gift to me. I don't own it. He can take it away any second he wants to. But then it said, and put frankincense on it. Um, I think this is in, if I'm not mistaken, in one place I was picking at the pastor about this the other day. I think it's in Revelation, like 5th chapter or something, where it talks about the, the prayers of the saints being as incense going up to God. Frankincense here, and it, it's a symbol of prayer. It's my labors, my giftings, my whatever, and they are all covered with prayer. And that, it, that goes before God in a sweet-smelling savor when I go that route, when I go that way. God can then anoint it. It's a natural sequel to that burnt offering. They often went together. Okay, it's it's not only me acknowledging, you know, the atonement of my sins, if you will, in burnt offering, but it, it's my giving back to God, thanking Him, being grateful because of what what He's done in my life as well. And and the Bible talks about in Leviticus two, two and three about it being a sweet savor. Unto, unto God. And then in, let me see if I can find it. Um, I think it's Leviticus 6. Yes. Leviticus 6, and, and I won't read it for time's sake because it's going to get away from me here in a minute, but in Leviticus 6, 13 through 16, the Bible talks about some ing other ingredients that are tied here. And in 6, 13, it uses one that says, 
and 13. Yep, that's not the right one. Then. Go to 14. I must have misquoted it. I'll have to look it up next week and give it back to you. But it talked about the fact that it was seasoned with salt. In other words, it, it, there was a flour, okay, and there was the the um, the oil and, and the incense. But in one place, it actually talked about that they seasoned the bread of it with salt. Is it when is it? Two thirteen, Leviticus. What I say, Leviticus six. My bad. Can you go to two thirteen, old media man? Yep, there you go. And every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. Why? Because salt in the old in the old Arab world, it was they used it as a um, as a stamp, if you will, on a covenant. They would bring salt. Now you know salt heals, preserves. I mean, you, you know all that. But the point here is that when when that salt was added, it speaks to that covenant relationship. There's also a place here that says, um, uh, in Leviticus 6, in like 14 or 15, it talks about um, it being unleavened bread. They would take it and make unleavened bread. Why unleavened? What difference did that make? Why not yeast? You know, my buddy over here, he likes the big fat yeast rolls. Remember, you know, the big fat ones. That's not what God asked for. He asked for unleavened. Why? Because there could be nothing that was puffed up. This was, not, this was about total humility before God. And that seasoning of salt is speaking to that covenant. I've made. I recognize what he's done for me. And I give all of myself, not my puffed up self, my gifts, remember? Oil, my gifts that the Spirit's given me. But I can't give my puffed up self back to God. I have to do that in an humble manner, acknowledging my covenant with God in, in that way, okay? This had to be total, sacrificial, a life given to God. This is not about me. When we hear any, when you hear me talk about me, then it's time for you to turn your hearing aid off. Why? Spiritual hearing aids off. Why? When I start talking about me, why, why you do that? Why you need to turn it off? Because nothing about this is about me. If I'm not relating it in some way to him, then and that's anybody, I don't care who it is, if they're taking the credit or they're taking the glory, God said he would not share his glory with not the first living being, nobody. So what this offering, this grain offering says, and in one place it even talked about honey, about not allowing honey, because they used honey a lot when they were making, you know, those Arab pancake, you know, deals. But no, no honey. Because honey was not a product of man's labor. It came from some. God says, I want it from your hand. I gave you the ability. I want it from your hand. Brother man can't make my sacrifice. He has to take care of that for himself. Only, only what comes from my hand. My sacrifice of labor has to be anointed by the oil of God's spirit. It must be offered with the incense of prayer. Everything I do must be seasoned with prayer. What if I'm making chili for the extravaganza? I'm not being ugly, but who needs to pray over chili? I don't know. I've made some I prayed over. I'm like, Lord, please. It doesn't look like it's coming out the right way, but when it's all said and done, would you please let this stuff work? Right? If you're a woman in here, you've done it more than once. If you're a baker, Lord, please don't let that cake fall. <laughs> I mean, that one's got to go to church. That one's going to the cakewalk or whatever. You know what I'm saying? But it's covered my efforts, my sacrifice of labor, anointed by the oil of the Spirit, offered with prayer, the incense of prayer, Absent of anything that puffs up, puffs it up, no leaven here, 
no sweetness of honey. It's just my giving of me, and it's seasoned with salt. It speaks of it being preserved because of my covenant with you. Oh, hallelujah. If you were Pentecostal for at least two and a half days, you should somewhere in the depth of your soul, when we talk about the covenant that has been paid, that's a hallelujah moment. Because I don't have to do this alone. I mean, maybe you get all up in that. I don't. I need all the help I can get. I have nothing. The Bible says my righteousness is what? What he said. Third one, Leviticus, the third chapter. We'll go to the peace offering. What is the peace offering? Peace offering um, is a way for me to express my gratitude to God. All three of these we've used so far, burnt grain and fellowship or peace offering, these are all voluntary offerings. Okay? It's a way for me to express my gratitude to God. It symbolizes peace and fellowship with God. In other words, I'm at fellowship with God, therefore I am at peace with God. Where Christ is concerned, it speaks to Christ is the only way I can be in fellowship with God. We say, we, the way we teach it would be what? There's only one way. Jesus is the only way. There is no other way. I am the how many ways? The way. I am the way, the truth, the life, right? Okay. So this peace offering, in the peace offering, um, the worshiper gets a piece of it back. Like when they do the whole, you know, it's not like a barbecue at Brother Henry's house. You know, you get a little bit back. So the peace offering, a portion of it comes back. This is a place of thanksgiving and fellowship, a table, if you will, spread of fellowship. It is man's meal with God. It is a place in this offering where I, I take my, my offering to God. I, I, I do my business here. It goes on the altar, but a piece of that comes back to me so that I partake, my family and I partake of this. And, and it cannot be done until after there is a sin offering. And, and let me read you this, just so you know where I'm coming from. This is found in Leviticus 7 and 20. But a soul that eateth the flesh of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, in other words, the part God lets you have back, if, if someone does that, having his uncleanliness upon him, even that soul would be cast out from his people. In other words, God said, you can't be principal principle. You can't be in fellowship, Melody Vaughn, with me. You can't, you can't get it back. We can't be sitting at the table of fellowship when you got sin in your heart. Why? Why? I thought God loved everybody. I mean, doesn't God love everybody? Yeah? Well, I mean, well, then why, why, why is this a problem? Number one, we go back to when I do not teach my children, my grandchildren, myself, when I do not teach that, that we cannot come to God without a spirit of holiness and reverence. We cannot. He will not accept it. I can't help what church service was today or I can't help what I think at home. God will not accept anything that is not holy. He won't. It doesn't matter what it looks like. If it's not holy, he will not accept it. He can't. How do I know that? Because the Bible said God turned his face from his own son. Why? Because Jesus had the sins of the whole world. And God couldn't do... Remember the part where Jesus said, "Why have you, fors my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God didn't forsake him. He just couldn't look on the sin of the world. We got to get that somewhere in our minds. Leviticus 7 and 21. Moreover, the soul that shall touch any unclean thing 
and eat of the flesh of the sacrifice of the peace offerings, even that soul is cut off. An individual who attempts to move into fellowship with God without a commitment to right living, righteousness, okay, right living, or without repentance, is setting himself to be cut off from God. God will not do that. Who told you that? God will not cut you off. Really? Really? Wow. I would encourage those, anyone who tells you that, to, I would encourage you to say, can you get me till Wednesday so we can do a Bible study together? Because I want to have all my scriptures together before we talk. Right? It's not about God's love. It's about his holiness. And he won't accept anything short of that. He just will not. All right. Number four. I'm hurrying because I know that clock is a ticking. All right. So the sin offering is found in Leviticus, the fourth chapter. What does that one look like? The sin offering is a required. This is not voluntary, by the way. This one, God said, is a got to do it. The sin offering is payment. Now, listen, don't get tripped up on this. For unintentional sin, neglect or thank or or lack of being thoughtful to God. It is about restoring fellowship with God. Christ's death paid the way for us to be restored back to God. Sin, the sin offering is about rest, is about being restored back to my rightful place with God. Okay? So let's talk about this. This is damaging. This is the one we're talking about. There were two types of, of two classes, if you will. Um, th- this isn't consecration anymore. This is, this is asking for reparation. In other words, this is about being restored back to God. Leviticus 4, 2, and 3 speak to the children of Israel saying, if a soul should sin through ignorance, this one says unintentionally, against any of the commandments of the Lord in anything which ought not to be done, or he does any of them, if the anointed priest sins, oh, wait a minute, whoop, stop, Erp. wait a minute, in 4.2, we're talking about anybody, but now we're talking in 4.3 about the, about the priest. Priests don't sin. Well, then why did God say if the anointed priest, notice he didn't even say to who is whosoever priest. He said an anointed priest. Can I help you with something? Who can fall? Well, not the holy people. Holy people don't fall. What do you do with the Bible when it talks about a good man falls seven times? Isn't that what it says? Now, I didn't say we need to go out and start making hash marks. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm trying to say is we're all my favorites. Ephesians 3 and 20, put that one on the tombstone. My second one is, okay, put that one under my arm on the way out. But it's, oh God, remember I am but dust. What does that mean? God, I'm just dirt. You made me out of nothing. And I could fall now. I could fall in 20 seconds. Right? But let me tell you how good God is even in the Old Testament. Oh, God's got all these, you know, things we got to do and blah, 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 and how hard it is. And, you know, it's hard to live for God. Is it? Well, salvation is free. You don't have to buy that, but if you're going to live for him, yeah, it gets tough. If the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, then let him offer to God for his sin, which he has sinned, and then it goes on to say what that is. So what is all this about the sin offering business? It also says, and we don't have time to go in it, but if you read in Leviticus, you'll see this. The type of animal that was offered depended on the rank and file of the person. In other words, if I was if if I couldn't afford if I was of, of a poorer nature and I couldn't afford, he made provision for that, brother man. He didn't expect me to try to go out and buy the goat or the, or the bull or the whatever. You see what I'm saying? But but whom to whom much is given, much is required, and and it's expensive. And so God talks about that. But God set it up so nobody's economic status would separate them from God. But rank demanded a greater penalty for sin. But it does not mean that anointed people can still not fall 
Any of us can sin at any time. But God's blessings are there because He has made provision. He's made a way for us. There's, there's such a thing as corporate sin. Does anybody know what I mean when I say corporate sin? I think the country we live in follows, falls under that, to be honest with you. You know what I mean by corporate sin? Okay, as opposed to individual sin. Individual sin is what? That would be me, right? Corporate sin. Churches don't sin, right? No, I mean churches don't sin, right? How come some of y'all snickering or smiling? What does that mean? Huh? A church could. What do you mean a whole church could sin? Yeah, a whole, a whole nation could sin. Look at Israel. Maybe all color, but look at America. Right? God says, listen, families can sin. Countries, nations, whomever. But when they sin, Leviticus 4 talks about there is a way to clean it up. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that God didn't just say, I'm going to make a grease spot out of you just to make a point. He does not do that. Even in the Old Testament where everybody had all the 600 and whatever laws to live by, they were all pointing you to Jesus. We live under Jesus now. But it does not take away from the holiness that is required. He just gave me somebody to help me. Thank you. I do some stuff for a lot. That just thrills my soul. There are types of sin. I'm just going to hit these and go so we won't get too far out of, out of uh, time here. There are types of sin. Leviticus 5 and 1. If a soul sin, listen, this is weird, and hear the voice of swearing, it is a witness whether he has seen or known of it. If he does not utter it, then that person who heard it bears the iniquity. The voice of swearing appears to be a reference to using the name of Jehovah in vain or some other form of inappropriate language. The individual here who is God's holding responsible was not the one doing the swearing. He was an innocent bystander, but he never addressed it. I thought about something we talked about in Sunday school this morning when you were talking about that, um, my Sunday school teacher. He says that is... Uh, that, that's, God's, God's not pleased with that. How do I approach it? Ask God. I don't know. I mean, I just have to ask God to tell us how to do that. And then there's one that says an environmental sin, five and two. If I touch something, remember, was it Samson? Was it Samson that couldn't touch the lion? Anyway, if there was, there was environmental sin, Leviticus five and two. He said, if you touch something unclean in your social environment, if you're contaminated by social, your social environment, there is uncleanliness in the world in which we live. Really? No. Are you surprised? Now, I'm going to read this guy so that nobody can say when I, we walk out of this church, she was riding the horse today. I'm just going to read straight out of the book. This guy wrote this in 1991 or something. Lyrics from records and radios that do not bring honor to God. I did not do that. If what I'm seeing on TV, if what I'm listening to on the radio in my car, if what Siri brings up, if I can't walk to this book and it say it, it glorifies God, what I need to do? I ever noticed on your phone, it doesn't matter how holy you are. This, they, I, they shove advertisements in your face. I'm like, I haven't even been looking or talking about anything like that. Why? I mean, really? You don't have to go. The, how many? Let's see. One, two, three, four. There's at least four of them in here. Riley, how old are you? How old are you? And how old is my man next to you? Okay. So 17 and under, I got at least four of them. Guys, they, they don't have to go looking for it. 
They don't have to look. It shows up. So don't we have a responsibility not to add to it. Does that make sense? Okay, um, suggestive messages from a billboard. Like, why would you put that on a billboard? Interstate, really? Media input. I think it was Brother Marion talked about it this morning. He pointed to your pocket, to, the, to your cell phone. He said, it, I mean, it walks with us everywhere we go, right? Brother Marion, I just can open it up. I didn't go looking. Okay. What? It has crossed my senses. Five senses, right? Like see, hear, touch, right? Once it has touched my senses, other than God doing something, it cannot be removed. You know that's why they talk about kids who do drugs. It's some of the was it, uh, crack, meth, and etc. How many times they got to do it before they're hung, hooked? How many? That's how lethal sin is. That's the whole point of all this. God's trying to burn that thing home. Okay, relational sin. Um, one, in, uh, one sin, if you will, transferring to another person or being in the area. It's kind of like saying, I'm, anybody know what I'm talking about when I say you walk by, um, they've just painted something? I'm telling you, if that man right there, if they, you have painted on this side of the room, he can be walking over there and somehow he gets paint on his clothes. I mean, how did, what, what did you, I don't know. I don't know where it came from. All you got to do is brush up by it. God said, if you brush up by it, I, you need, Melody Vaughn, you need to get rid of that mess. You need to offer that sacrifice to clean it up. That's a sin. Not only is the individual, again, I'm reading, not only is the individual who sinned responsible, but any person, who is a carrier of the contaminant is guilty as well. Example, ungodly attitudes. I'm just talking with my friend on the phone. We're not gossiping, we're just sharing. Now, I'm reading out of the book. Don't give me that. I'm not meddling, it's in this book. Let you read it. Ungodly attitude. Jokes that are inappropriate for a Christian. If I'm sitting there and I say what, and I participate in a conversation that if Jesus were there, I would be embarrassed, I got two choices. One of them is get up and leave or address it. Now, I don't mean address it. God's got to help me address it the right way. Okay, so be careful there. No slinging swords. You see what I'm saying? I did not say that. It's out of the book. Appetite. If I'm hanging with people, that this is environmental sin. Who are you hanging with? If I'm hanging with people who are doing I'm not doing it, y'all. It is, this is in Leviticus 5. I'm not doing it. But I'm in there with them while they're doing it. What is it saying about my testimony? Well, I'm trying to win them to Jesus. Okay, so we got we got to talk about this real quick. It is now 7:20. We can either finish or, or go next week. You tell me. Y'all the one got to go home. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, so quick example. I, I had a job that took me on a trip to New Orleans. I'm from Williamsburg County. I didn't need to be in New Orleans. I'm going to just leave you with that, okay? I didn't even know what half of that stuff was. This was like probably, you know, 20 years ago. But I was with my boss and, and the lady I worked for. And we, we walked out of the hotel. We were walking down the street, and they were trying to figure out where we were going to eat. I mean, we were on company business. Brother Henry, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about when I go down this trip. I, from some of the stories you told me in your past. <laughs> they walked by, and, and we're going, um, they didn't ask me, by the way. You know what I'm saying? And they just turned and walked into this place. 
I knew about the time I got to the door. This was probably not a good place for a Church of God preacher's wife to be. And they stopped at the bar. My boss says, now you don't have to drink. They got soda here. I said, I tell you what, guys, I'll be right here when you come out. And they said, no, 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 we'll just stop here till they get us a table. We're going we're gonna to eat here. And I said, I tell you what, really, it's okay. Now, that would have been my chance to get a good meal on somebody else's dollar, right? Now, I would like to tell you that I was all holy when I did that. I'm telling you, it felt like there was 14 elephants stomping in my belly because I'm wondering, I hope I got a job when this is over. But I knew if I hung in that place, well, who's going to see you? Was anybody from South Carolina there? My boss and my boss were there. I'm just saying. That's what he's talking about here. All right, let me hurry. In Leviticus 5 and 4, there's the sin of I made a promise, but I didn't follow through. I said I was going to do it, but I didn't do it. Okay, that one. All right, so all of those, God says, you still got to deal with them, Melody Vaughn. You can't let it go. Some of those I felt condemned when I was studying. I'm like, God, if you want me to address it, you got to tell me how to do it. Because sometimes on meetings at work, I just turn my camera off and turn my volume down. Now, I'm not talking about when they're working. But you know, you know the, what is it, water cooler? You know, the water cooler chatter? I just, and I want you to know my boss called me out. Ooh, I hope she doesn't listen to this live stream, huh? But she called me out. Why are you cutting your, why are you doing that? I don't want you cutting your camera off. I said, yes, I do not have a problem with that. I'm not trying to be disobedient to you. I'm just telling you, but when it gets off, when it gets kind of get off on that field, you know, I, I don't, you're very well aware I don't talk like that. So I just assume, you know. So if I miss something, let me know. I never did tell her I was cutting that back on when all that started. I was very clear. Now, I'll, I'll cut my camera on for all the meetings. But once that starts, I just want you to know my camera's off and my volume's down. Well, maybe I should address it. Maybe I ought to call them out. I don't know. Please pray for me. I, I don't really know what to do with that. I'm just telling you, I, it grieved my spirit. I couldn't do it. Last one, Leviticus 5, the trespass offering. This one has to do with moral um, sin offering or had to do with moral failures that were unintentional, but the trespass offering had, had intent. So let me read that one really quickly, and then we'll, get, we'll go. So the sin offering is unintentional sin. You really didn't go out to do it. It just kind of came apart and came along. And then there was the trespass offering, the guilt offering. This is making payments against, it's, it's kind of being compensatory, if you will, to the injured party, both God and others. Christ's death paid for the consequences of my sin. I can't, I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. Trespass offering it was for sin which involved intent. I knew I did it. It is un the understanding that not only was I, and this is Leviticus 5 and 16, the Bible said, when you make amends for harm that is done, it shall be added another fifth part. In other words, it wasn't enough just to pay back what you had done. And when I say pay back, that's not always the money. But you had to add 20% to it. It's that 20% gratuity none of us like to pay. You know what I'm saying? But he said, but it wasn't enough to just say, I'm sorry. Had to go above and beyond that. Had to prove it hurt. It pitched into my whatever, pocketbook or, you know, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I knew I did it, and I... Uh, I had to go back, Brother Marion, I had to go back, and I had to not just say I'm sorry, I had to do something about it. But that's the kind that hurt. 
That's the kind that get you right where you're living. You know what I'm saying? You can't just, who was that talking about the, Sister Glenda, we told your story, Children's Church. I'm sorry. She knows what I'm talking about. But I got to show that I'm sorry. Payment's expensive because I realize what I've done. And it grieved my spirit based on what, what this principle is. And it said, not just to God, I got to go back to you. I, but Jimmy, I can't just ask for God for, well, I ask God for forgiveness. What I mean, did you go back to Sally? No, I didn't go back to Sally now. Sally didn't even know I did that. I don't want Sally to know I did that. That guilt offering said, I got to make it right this way. I got to make it right this way. How many of us want our sin to be shown to the world? God said, You got to clean it up now. It's not just good enough to hide it, you got to clean it up. And they got to know that you cleaned it up, they got to see that you meant it. You got to put some meat behind that okay it is now 729 I'm 15 minutes over and we're going to end I'm going to land this plane because somebody my son will dog me about it because I dog it whenever he's late so we we will pick it up next time and we'll go from there into we're moving to the labor um, we're moving to the principles of the outer court so we move into the, to the labor uh, Next, next time along, I, I hope you're getting something. I hope somewhere it, it feeds your mind, gets your juices flowing up here, thinking about what's going on here. And I, I hope that wasn't too scattered for you, but guys, here's the deal at the end of the day. The reason God instituted the sacrifices is for all of us to understand sin is costly and we must make every detailed effort to stay away. If I, I, I believe Brother Marion said this this morning. I'm quoting you a lot today, Brother. If I'm not mistaken, he made some comment. If I know I have a weakness in that area, then I need to do everything I can to what? How close can I get? But it's not a problem for Miss Mary. But it's a problem for me. Lord, please help us to learn from your word today. That we don't just set aside what you have told us. God, let every one of us, start with me, every one of us, understand the significance of sin, the cost of the innocent that are harmed.